All rise. This honorable superior court for the judicial district of Stanford, I stand for the transaction of home business is now open in session. Honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Please be seated. Thank you. Is there anything to take up before we call the jury out? I don't believe so. Thank you. The court is going to inform the jury of the schedule. We can bring the jury out. Would counsel stipulate, please? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. The court is going to advise you of what the schedule will be for the next couple of days. Tomorrow we will not be in session. Monday is a state holiday. We will not be in session. So Friday and Monday, you will not be in session. And we will resume on Tuesday. The state continues with its case this morning. Yes, Your Honor. The state would call Mark News to the scan. May I approach the clerk, Your Honor? Yes. My name is Mark, M-A-R-K, New, N-E-W-T-H. Mr. Newth, you may be seated. Thank you. You may inquire, Attorney Manning. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. By whom are you employed? I'm employed at the State of Connecticut Forensic Science Laboratory in Meriden, Connecticut. Are you in a particular division or department of the forensic lab? For the last 12 years, I have been in the computer crimes and electronic evidence lab. What kinds of things does the computer crimes and evidence lab do? We examine data from electronic devices, primarily cell phones, computers, laptops, tablets, things like that. Can you please describe to the jury some of your educational background and training and experience that qualifies you to do that? Yeah, sure. I started forensic science training or digital evidence training in 2012. And I did things like certification in NCASE, which is one of the primary forensic tools, certification in FTK forensic toolkit. I did advanced Windows forensics, advanced Macintosh forensics. In 2015, I got certifications in all the cell phone forensics, Celebrate, certified forensic examiner. And then as pertaining to this case in 2017, I went to an extensive school regarding the Berla IV vehicle forensics. And I was certified as a vehicle forensics examiner in 2017, I think that was. If you can just explain a little bit about what vehicle forensics is. Well, vehicle forensics is similar to cell phone forensics. Most vehicles that are manufactured today 
have a lot of computers in them. But they have a particular computer uh, that's identified as the infotainment system. And people are able to syn synchronize their cell phones with the infotainment system. And also they use it for GPS coordinates when you're, when you're traveling. And these vehicles can record valuable GPS data as your, as your vehicle's in motion. And they also download data from your cell phones and, and store that as well. So in terms of law enforcement investigations, there can be valuable evidence on these infotainment systems. Um, so software has been created to download and retrieve this evidence and examine it primarily for law enforcement applications. What is some of the software? Well, the primary tool is from a company called Burla, and the software is called Ivy, I-V-E. Um, and that's been around for, for a while, and it's, it's the industry standard, really, for vehicle forensics now. Um, and we use the Burla IV system to extract vehicle data and then um, interpret it and analyze it. And have you been trained in the Burla system? Yes, I have. Now, if you could walk through exactly how that extraction process works. Well, yeah, sure. Every vehicle system is different. Uh, it depends on the manufacturer, and some manufacturers utilize multiple systems, so it depends what system is in the vehicle. There are systems where we can just go to the vehicle with a jump drive and plug the jump drive into the vehicle, and we can download the data right from the vehicle. But that's fairly rare. Most vehicles, what we have to do is we actually have to go in and physically remove the infotainment system from the car. Then we usually give it to the law enforcement agency that pulled the warrant, and they submit it to the forensic lab for analysis and examination. Then when I get the infotainment system at the lab, um, usually, usually there's two methods primarily for the data extraction. One, the, the system could contain a hard drive, and that's usually the easiest way. I can remove the hard drive from the system, attach it through write blocking to my forensic computer, and I can do the extraction using the IV software. Other systems don't have a hard drive. They have a memory chip attached, physically attached to a motherboard within the system. So what we need to do is remove the motherboard and attach what we call a DIB board to the motherboard and then some wires to the DIB board so that we can make a connection between the computer and the infotainment module. Um, and then using the software, we can then do the data extraction. With respect to the da data extraction, how and what types of data are you able to get from an infotainment center? Well, there's primarily two types of data, two categories. There's cell phone related data or what we call connected devices. Any type of physical electronic device that connected to that system, usually either through a Bluetooth connection, which is a wireless connection, or through a USB connection with a, with a physical USB wire. Um, the second type of data is the GPS data. Um, the main difference is GPS data is generated by the vehicle system itself as the vehicle is traveling. The cell phone data generally comes from the cell phones. Whenever you synchronize the cell phone to the system, it downloads the data from the cell phones. And that is so that the vehicle user you know, has their contacts and their phone call history available to them in the system if they want to make a call. Um, and I, most people I've seen that because they have these types of systems in their car and they've used them to make phone calls. So those are the two types of data. Cell phone data, which generally comes from the phone, and GPS data, which comes from the car system itself. With the cell phone data, is the infotainment center able to reach in and I guess, I guess the question is get as much data or what information can they get from the phone? Like, uh, yeah, it's usually to... um, phone call related data. Like it's not going to go into your Facebook app or your social media or any stuff like that. It's only it only retrieves cell, uh, phone call data. So most systems you get your phone call history so that you know who your recent phone calls were. You can touch your touch screen and go to recent calls and call back someone who just called you. Right. And it also will record um, your contacts. So any contacts that in your device will get downloaded so you can do voice call and say, you know, call Aunt Sarah or whatever it might be. Um, 
So primarily, it's phone call data. Some systems do record text message data, uh, but not all systems. So not all systems. Are all systems different? Does it matter the make, model, and Oh, it, it matters a lot. The data set that we get from, from vehicles can vary depending on what infotainment system, system is present in that vehicle, yeah. Is there, a, well, is the data recorded and saved? Yeah, well, every system's different. Some systems save things longer, but for the most part, the systems consider this data, especially the GPS data, they consider this data disposable. It's not, the user doesn't have access. You can't like go into the, to the user interface and recover your data. It's not designed to do that. The, the, the data is considered disposable. So after the vehicle's shut off from a trip, most of the data is commonly marked for deletion. Now, even though it's marked for deletion, the data can still be present on the drive and we can retrieve it. It doesn't disappear until it actually gets what we call overwritten or replaced by new data that's being stored. Does, so does that you, make sense? You mentioned um, when the car gets shut off, the data gets deleted. Um, that, is that, that does that happen every happen. time the car gets shut off? Well, again, it depends on the systems. Mm -hmm. uh, some systems might do that. Other systems might save it longer. Um, every system, it, it not only depends on the system, it can also depend on the firmware version that that system is running. You know, all these systems run on software, and all these softwares are constantly updated with new software, and the new software can even change how things are done when an update is installed. So it's, it's a question that's hard to answer. As the data is saved, is it, is it saved in any sort of sequence or time sequence? <laughs> Well, the data is, like GPS data is saved immediately as it occurs. Um, where it's saved onto the, onto the drive in terms of what sectors is a kind of random. Um, that's determined by, th these devices have what's called a wear leather, a leveling algorithm in them for the most part. And I don't mean to be confusing with that. What it simply means is uh, computer hard drives can wear out over time. And the computer hard drives are made up of sectors. They have thousands of tiny little sectors, like pockets. And the data is broken up and saved a little bit into each sector. And what happens over time is these sectors can wear out or get damaged. And so what the, all the wear leveling app does is spread out the use of these sectors to try and make them last longer to prolong the life of the device. That, that's all it does. So where the data is saved is determined by where leveling, usually. Now, if the data is saved in the different sectors, does that factor into how it is overwritten over time, if I'm using that term correctly? Yes, because when the device overwrites, it decides on what sectors to utilize for writing the new data, often based on the where leveling algorithm. So is it safe to say that when you are able to download information, particularly with respect to GPS tracking, you may not get all, be able to get as much information as, or Right, depending on the system. Some systems overwrite more frequently than other systems, but yes, data can be overwritten, and once the data is overwritten, it's lost to us. So sometimes the data set can be patchy with time frames missing from it. What is the difference between a extraction using the IVE or Burla system that you described and a chip off? Well, chip off is a different method um, and chip off can be done with anything, not just a vehicle. Cell phones, you can do a chip off. What chip off means is simply that um, you physically remove the chip from the motherboard and you attach it to another device to try and extract the memory from it, uh, extract the data from it. The chip-off method, the difference is, is that the chip-off method is destructive. I mean, once you remove that chip from that motherboard, you've basically ruined that device. There's probably no fixing it. Um, so we try to avoid using chip-off. If, if we're able to use the Burla, we prefer to use it because the device can then be reinstalled in the vehicle and, and return to use. Did you utilize the Burla system in evaluating vehicles owned by Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos in 2019? 
Uh, yes, I did. Did you or somebody from the lab actually remove the infotainment center from the vehicles? Yes, in this case, myself and one of my colleagues, uh, Jennifer Hernandez Ortiz, went out to the, um, to, I believe they were, the vehicles were at New Canaan PD, if I remember correct. We went to New Canaan PD and physically removed uh, the infotainment systems from the vehicles, turned them over to the police detectives to submit to the lab. I want to ask you a couple questions about a Ford Raptor owned by Fotis Dulos. Did you remove the infotainment center from the Ford Raptor? Um, yes, either myself or my colleague removed it. We were both present. And um, we, we removed it and then later examined it. It was submitted to the lab for request for analysis? Yes, it was. Okay. Uh, did you utilize the chip off or the Burla method? <clears throat> we usually utilized the Burla method. Okay. And were you able to obtain uh, GPS data off of that Burla? I guess, it, well, let me withdraw that and just ask you, what do you call the end result? Is it a Burla report or is there a name for the report after you are able to download the information? Uh, I call it a data extraction. Data extraction. We, we were able to create a data extraction of uh, that infotainment system from the F-150 Raptor and we were able to an analyze the data from that extraction. Was there GPS information or data within that data? data extraction? Yes, there was some, yeah. Okay. By some, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, some, it's, it's amazing the difference you can get from some of these systems. Sometimes I get I knew a GPS that's so complete, I know everywhere that that vehicle was for an entire 24-hour period. And sometimes you get data that's more patchy because the data may be missing because of overwriting or other reasons. So this was a case where we got some GPS data, but we have patches in time that are missing. With a Ford Raptor, that make and model of the vehicle, are there different types of infotainment centers? Well, yeah, Ford uses a system that they designed. It's manufactured by another company, but they designed it. It's called the Sync System. Um, and there's three generations of Ford Sync system that you can find in Ford vehicles. And they're just simply called Sync Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3. What is the difference between Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3? Well, um, capabilities, um, data storage. I mean, they just each generation improved upon the last in terms of the thing's capabilities, its um, memory storage, and its uh, data storage. What sync gen or generation, um, I guess, uh, was, and I'm probably butchering how to say this, but what was the Ford Raptor that you examined? Yeah, Fotis Dulos is, had a 2014 <laughs> Ford Raptor, and it contained a sync gen 2 uh, infotainment system. So let's talk about the sync gen 2 infotainment center or system. What were the capabilities that you were able to download from that system? That system contained, like I said, some GPS data, but it was spotty. Some of it was missing, probably due to overwriting or other factors. And it contained phone call history, connected device, a list of connected devices, and it contained contacts, phone contacts. <clears throat> Now, as it's stored information, was it stored in real time or UTC time? On this, it can be, sometimes the devices report in local time, sometimes they report in UTC. Fotis Dulos's vehicle uh, displayed times in UTC. If you can just explain what UTC is, please. Yeah, UTC is basically time zone zero in Greenwich, England. It used to be called Greenwich Mean Time, but it means it's the initial time zone and you would convert the, the time zone based to what time zone you're currently in, you would convert the time zone from UTC or Greenwich Mean Time, like in the summertime here in, in Connecticut, New York time zone, um, we would be minus four hours from UTC. That's what the time is in basically London, England. Is that a time frame that is used throughout digital devices? It's commonly used, yeah. Did you examine the GPS data that came out of the Ford Raptor in 2019? Uh, yes, I did. 
Um, by the way, can I ask you, if the results of this data extraction, how big was it? Oh, it's huge. It's over a thousand pages, I'm sure. When we create a PDF report of the entire extraction, it's quite large. Okay. Oh, did you take that information and examine whether or not there were uh, <clears throat> the GPS, I guess, track logs, is that what they're called? Yes, there, um, there's a couple different ways you can get a GPS point of data. Um, the primary one is called a tracking log. A tracking log is data that the vehicle's recording as it's moving about where it is and how fast it's going and things like that. Um, the other can be called a, a, a vehicle event, they call it. Like some vehicles might record when you step on the brakes, when you shift the gear shift, when you open the door. And when it records a vehicle event like that, it will often mark the GPS coordinates of where that occurred. Did you examine the Ford Raptor for May 23rd and May 24th, 2019 in their, um, the GPS, either track logs or any form of GPS data extraction? Uh, yes, I did. That was the time frame of interest that investigators uh, gave to us. And so that's the time frame that we concentrated on for the data. Were you able to get a continuous point of track for all the times that that um, extracted data point showed? No, unfortunately not. We got a spotty data set, we call it, meaning that portions of the time frame were missing or not present. Was that because of the uh, deletion and overwriting that had been occurring? Well, in this case, it's, it's probably related to two reasons. Number one is overwriting, which is com commonly happens. And number two, when I did this data extraction, I got an error message that indicated that there were bad sectors on this drive, meaning that this drive was already starting to wear out a little bit and some of the sectors could not be read. So whatever data was in those sectors that were determined to be bad, that's data that was also lost. Could a user manually go in and change the location data or GPS coordinates? Not, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Did you create a report kind of simplifying the GPS data for yes, this case? Yes, I always do that because looking at the GPS data in a, in a PDF sheet with just a bunch of, of coordinates is confusing. So usually what I do is I just copy out portions of the portions of the map with the GPS dot points on it. And I, I create a PDF report of that so that it's much simpler for everyone to understand. If I may, Your Honor. Yes. May I approach on it? Yes. Sure, I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you what's been marked as states one twenty nine for ID. If you could take a minute and take a look at that document. Sure. What is that document, sir? Uh, this is the PDF report that I created um, relating to the GPS data from the dates of 523.19 and 524.19 um, of the F-150 Raptor. Does it contain all the data points with respect to the GPS data extraction that you were able to pull from the Berlin report? Yes, it, it contains all recovered GPS data from those dates. Are there times missing that are not, it's not a continuous 24 hours, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. But it, is that because that's the only data that you did receive? Yes, I mean, all we can report on is the data that we're able to retrieve. And at the bottom of the PDF, does it also have the data points for the, that you actually? Yeah, at the end of this PDF, I actually pasted in all of the data points as they appeared in the Berla Ivy software so that they could be reviewed if anybody needed to see them. Stay would offer it at this time, Your Honor. What's the number, please? 129. May I go up to you? Yes. Um, Good morning, sir. Good morning. It's my understanding that um, this is a document you created from what was essentially computer data that you downloaded off the vehicle, the Ford Raptor, correct? Yeah, that's correct. 
Um, there are maps in this particular uh, exhibit. Did you create those maps? No, those maps display in the Burla Ivy software, and I just cut and pasted them into the document. Were there more than the ones that are in what you were just shown for that uh, time frame? Not for this time frame. I believe I showed, I displayed every point of data from this time frame. From when the time frame would be from uh, May 23rd through May 24th, correct? Yeah. I can't remember now if they asked me for earlier in the day, May 23rd. I think it might have been the evening of May 23rd through the day of the 24th. So, so you're not sure when they asked you to start? Yeah, I can't remember if they, I, I remember them asking me for the evening. I don't remember if there were earlier, no, I don't think there were earlier time frames, but I would have to double check on in terms of the 23rd. All right, and I just want to ask you, there are some red dots and some green dots that mm -hmm. have been entered. Those, were those uh, in that color as you, as it was downloaded yeah. out of the system? Yes, correct. I didn't change any colors. And, uh, and just so I'm understanding before this comes in, do these dots represent uh, um, geographical uh, coordinates? Yes, they do. Is there a range for these coordinates? Um, no, it's pretty specific. There's, there's no range. When I say range, I mean, is, you know, if I, for example, if I were to um, stand with, um, let's say, a cell phone, it has geolocation as well, right? Yes, it does. But sometimes, uh, if I'm watching it on, like, find my, find my device, it might move around a bit. Is there a, that's what I mean by a range, is there yes. 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet? Oh, I see. You're asking for the accuracy range? Yes. Um, the different types of, of uh, location data that can be retrieved from cell phones or infotainment systems, there's a couple different types. You can get location data from cell towers, that's usually less accurate. The most accurate type of location data is data that comes from satellite. Um, this data comes from satellite and they say that it's accurate within, I think like 16 feet is the analysis. Um, that, that was my, be, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, that, that's enough? Well, you don't want me to? First, no, we have ahead. to understand that this is voir dire. Right. I'm trying to understand the accuracy of this. To well, that's cross-examination. I'm, I'm just trying to, so the location that's on here, this isn't something you added, correct? Correct. This is straight from the IV software data extraction. But it's only approximate, the, look, the dots are only approximate to the location, correct? <clears throat> um, in my experience, it's pretty specific. I mean, it's, it's going to be accurate within a few feet. When you say a few, do you mean 16 to 20 feet? Well, 16 is the rule, but I, I mean, I've done cases where I've put GPS points in specific parking spaces and parking lots, and we've pulled the video from that parking lot, and you can see the car drive into the exact parking space that it was I, that it parked it. So, in my experience, I've done a lot of these extractions. I found this data to be pretty specific, pretty accurate. All right, but, you, but as far as this document is concerned, you're still indicating that you don't know whether it's approximate or specifically pinpoint as far as this document is concerned. Your Honor, I'm objecting right. at this point. We're... This is not voir dire. I'm sorry, Your Honor? This is not voir dire. How accurate are the coordinates is not the subject of voir dire. Well, I believe the accuracy of the map would be relevant to voir dire. That's the my reason for the voir dire. The accuracy of the map is relevant to cross-examination. Let me just have a moment. Well, with the caveat that I mentioned, I don't have any objection. What is the exhibit number, please? 129, Your Honor. States 129, admitted as quote. Thank you. May I publish, Your Honor? Yes. It should be. Sir, do you have the document in front of you? Yes, if I may.
country, sir, if you can either see the screen in front of you or actually, would you mind, Your Honor, may I just ask him to stand up by yeah. the country? Sir, would you mind taking a uh, step in behind you and pointing to the screen? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, is this the document that you created? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Now, the top line, the 523-2019, what does that indicate? Yes, this is right. And that's May 23rd, 2019? Right. 4.52 p.m., 5.05, and 5.09 to 5.10 at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Um, could you just explain that line in connection with the maps below? And I'm going to move it up just a little bit to show the whole page. You can see that the vehicle's parked here uh, behind this house. And in here, you can see that the vehicle moved. The blue line indicates the movement of the vehicle from now you have a couple times up here, 425, 505. Which dots are related to the times? Uh, this would be the first one and then the second one. And 524, 2019, at 7.55 a.m. at a house at 27 Spring Lane in Simsbury. Can you please explain what that map shows? Um, there's a location of the vehicle parked in front of a home and Google Maps showed that home to be 27 Spring Lane, Simsbury. And the bottom photograph, please. Um, later that morning, we're at 9.53 a.m. And the house is, or the, it's now at a house in New Canaan, Connecticut, and that is, um, 61 Sturbridge Hill Road, New Canaan. Between 7.55 a.m. at Simsbury and 9.53 a.m. at Sturbridge Hill Road in New Canaan, do you have any GPS data tracking between those time periods? No, these two time periods were continuous. It, it, um, the next point of data was 9.53 a.m. in New Canaan. And the next page, sir. Okay, so later that afternoon, you can see we're now at 4.21 p.m., and that's local time. Um, the vehicle's traveling on Route 84 through the town of Plainville. Now, this is all the Ford Raptor, correct? Yeah, this is the Ford F-150 Raptor. Okay. Now, between 12.30 p.m. in Sturbridge Hill Road in New Canaan, and 4.21 p.m. on Interstate 84 in Plainville. Did the Berlin system give you any data, GPS tracking points for that time period? No, those time frames are not present. And that just means it could have been overwritten or damaged in any way? Projection meetings. Well, there's already been testimony that overwriting or damaged sectors can contribute to spotty data overruled. And Sir, was there damaged sectors found in the Ford Raptor infotainment center that you received? Yes, there was. The bottom map, please. At 4.32 p.m., um, a GPS point is recorded at a gas station on Route 4 in Farmington, Connecticut. And by the way, this gives you no information about the driver or who is operating the vehicle or? No, I, I know nothing about who might be occupying the vehicle. And the next page, sir, if you will. Uh, at 5.03 to 5.05 p.m., um, there's a track log showing the, the, uh, the vehicle moving along Eli Road in Farmington, in the area of Talcott Notch Road. And the bottom map, I'm sorry, I'll move it up. Uh, at 5.38 to 6 p.m., the vehicle is back at 4 Jefferson Crossing. And the next page, sir. At 7.48 p.m., there's one GPS point of data showing the vehicle on Albany Avenue in Hartford, <coughs> right near the intersection of Adams Street. Now between, I think it's 6 p.m. at Fort Jefferson Crossing, and 7.48 p.m. on Albany Avenue. Did you have any data sets that were able to be obtained from the Burla system? 
I uh, know. Okay. No, that, that date is missing. You have, if you could read the next one, sir, please. Yeah, this was one of the longer track logs that was able to, able to be retrieved. At 7.48 p.m. to 7.55 p.m., um, the vehicle drives from Albany Avenue in Hartford down Albany Avenue to Bishop's Corner in West Hartford. And it enters a plaza there. I believe that's Crown Market and Starbucks Plaza at Bishop's Corner. And the next one, please. Can you move it up a little? Oh, I apologize. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, now we're up to 8.08 to 8.10 p.m. There's a one data set of a track log driving along Deer Cliff Road near Farmington, West Hartford. I'm not sure exactly which town that's in. It's right near the border, I think. And the last one, sir, if you could. Yeah, at 8.14 p.m., the vehicle is shown moving along the side of the house at Ford Jefferson Crossing. And at the bottom of the page, if you could just explain what that is. These are the data points, the, the track logs that I use to create this document as they are copied right out of the Burla software. Now, sir, they are indicated the word recovered, for instance, the first line, recovered 0035. What does that mean? Recovered means that it was marked as deleted, but the software was able to recover it because it wasn't overwritten. 035 is the number that tra of that track log that was assigned to it by the software when that track log was created. And over, if you follow that line all the way over, you have the word adjusted EST. What does that mean? These, these time frames were um, displayed in UTC and they had to be adjusted minus four hours to correct them to Eastern time. And just the last page, sir. Again, this is up to the last track log that was used there at um, number 52. And was this data part of that thousand pages that yes. came out of that report? Yes, it's in there, yeah. Okay, you can have a seat, thank you very much. Sir, was there also a time that you reviewed or examined a um, 2017 Chevy Suburban? Uh, yes, there was. When was that? Um, that was around the same time frame as this. It was in um, May of 2019. Did you remove the infotainment center out of that device or that car? Yes, again, me and my associate went and uh, removed the infotainment system, yeah. Did you process that at the lab using, using the same process, the Burla uh, yes, software? Yes, the exact same process, yeah. Okay. And were you able to recover any data from the 2017 Chevy Suburban? Yes, we did get some data. How much data were you able to obtain? We obtained uh, quite a bit of connected devices and phone data, um, but not very much GPS data in that extraction. Were you able to obtain any GPS data for May 24th, 2019? No, not from the Chevy Suburban. With respect to phone data, what were you able to determine? Um, well, let me just ask it generally. What kind of phone data were you able to get from the 2017 Chevy Suburban? We were able to get a list of connected devices uh, with a display of local time, dates and times. Um, we were able to retrieve a lot of uh, phone contacts and phone call history. By phone call history and phone contacts, were you able to reach into that device to determine whose device it was? We got very limited data to determine whose device is what. We get the cell phone's name. You know, um, usually when you set up your cell phone, owners have the option of typing in a name. Um, and we get the unique identifier that Burla uses is the Bluetooth MAC address. So we usually get the Bluetooth MAC address of all the devices. If you could just explain what a Bluetooth MAC address is. Oh, sure. Whenever a device connects through Bluetooth, um, 
the system needs a way to synchronize the devices. And like computers use IP addresses when you're connecting to the internet, Bluetooth connects through what's called a Bluetooth MAC address. It's a unique number to each, assigned to each Bluetooth device so that they can communicate with each other. And is that unique name or num number, it's a number, is that associated we'll with the device or is that associated with the infotainment center Bluetooth? I just well, sure. both devices contain Bluetooth, so both the infotainment center and the cell phone will have a Bluetooth MAC address. Okay. Did you utilize that same IVE report or Barilla system that you discussed earlier with the 2017 uh, Chevy Suburban? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. If I may, I'm going to show you what's been marked as states 130. That's what the game is at. Yep, no objection. No objection. Uh, Your Honor, I don't believe there's any objection, but if I may, I would Thank move you. 130 in the evidence if I may inquire. States 130 admitted as full. Sir, I'm handing you states 130. If you could just explain what that document is, please. This is a portion of the data extraction that I performed uh, from the 2017 Chevy Suburban um, in relation to this case. You indicated with the Ford Raptor it was thousands of pages. How much was it with the Chevy Suburban? It might not have been quite as big, but I'm sure it was still pretty large. And if you can, sir, what if information is obtained from that document? Um, this document relates specifically to connected or attached devices, devices that attach to uh, the system via Bluetooth. If I may publish, Your Honor? Yes. So I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing and take a stand next to the TV, if you can, and I can ask you some questions about the states 130. Sir, if you could just explain a little bit about the writing on the upper left and what we're looking at here. Um, this is the IV report. This is the lab case number for this and the vehicle description 20 Chevrolet uh, Suburban, 2017 Chevrolet Suburban. And there's on the, let me zoom in a little bit. Is this a lot of the technical information that came out of the Berla report? Yes. And down here, sir, you can That was way too far. Before I break the ammo, I'm going to move on. All right, it's page two, sir. If I may just ask assistance, Your Honor. If I may, Your Honor. If I may, Your Honor. Thank you. Sir, if you could take a look at page two, and we have attached devices. What does that mean? Those are the devices that have uh, attached themselves to this uh, infotainment system via Bluetooth. Now, the first line down at the bottom, I don't know if you could see, it says embedded device. What does that mean? 
Um, that's the infotainment system itself. And if you see over here where it says U unique number Bluetooth address, that's the Bluetooth MAC address of the infotainment system itself. And the line under it that reads iPhone, what is that? This is a device that connected to the system, iPhone connected via Bluetooth. This is the Bluetooth MAC address of that specific iPhone model. Now, does this iPhone have a name or a contact person associated with it? It's just called iPhone. And at what time or day was it paired with the, um, with the Chevy Suburban Infotainment Center? And I should actually, as I say that, ask you a foundation question of what does it mean to pair something? Yeah, well, what it means is the two devices uh, make a connection with each other so that they can communicate and exchange data. Is there a date that the iPhone listed there made that connection and paired with the uh, Bluetooth connected or embedded in Right the here, you can see paired time, Friday, May 24th, 145632, year 2019. Is that paired or connected time? That's the paired time, which means it connected to, they connected to each other. It okay, connected to each other. Okay, that 145632, 2019, is that UTC time or? No, that is local time. So military time, that would be 256, is that right? Correct. In the afternoon. How is the, is a device able to connect to a vehicle infotainment center if the vehicle is off? The infotainment system has to be powered on in order for the connection to be made. It can't connect if it's not powered, if it doesn't have power. How close does that phone or device have to be to the vehicle to make that connection? Yeah, in my experience, the range for these things is, can be as much as 50 feet, I think. 50 feet of the vehicle? Yeah. The two devices have to be within 50. Now, this wasn't a new device. It only connected that day, correct? Correct. Um, how do you know that? These devices generally record the date of the initial or first pairing of the device, and then the last pairing of the device. They're usually the two dates and times that we get. Um, it looks like the paired time, meaning which means the initial paired time, the first time it paired, was Thursday, July 5th, uh, of 2018. And you don't know if this car, if this phone belonged to Jennifer Dulos, do you? I, I do not. Do you know if it belonged to any of her children? I do not. And do you know if it belonged to Lauren Almeida? Do you even know who that is? I don't know who that is. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to page three, sir. Is there another device that actually was paired with the Chevy Suburban as well? This is another Bluetooth device, and it shows a connection time Sunday, May 5th uh, of 2019. And this is the unique Bluetooth MAC address for that particular cell phone. And page four, are there other devices as well? Yes, these, there's two more devices here on this page. You can see Jennifer, Jennifer Dulos iPhone 2. Um, I, don't see a, I don't see a connection time on that. There's one called Petros's iPad Bluetooth device. And the last page, sir. One called Petros's iPhone. And we have a connection time on that, Sunday, November 12th of 2017. So suffice to say these phones, you don't know if they were inside the vehicle or within 50 feet of the vehicle at the time that they were connected. I mean, I can only testify to what the data tells me. The data tells me that a connection was made. It doesn't give me the distance the phone was from the device when it connected. That's not something you can quote. Thank you, sir. You can have a seat.
If I may just have one moment, Your Honor. Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you very much, sir. Cross-examination, please. Yes, sir. As I understand it, each infotainment system for different models is somewhat different. Is that a fair statement? For each manufacturer, yeah. Do Ford Motor Vehicles have uh, usually have a different manufacturer of their infotainment system than General Motors in your experience? Yes. So that the data that you might be able to extract from a Ford vehicle may be different in terms of quantity or even quality than what you might get from a Chevrolet uh, model vehicle, correct? Well, I would say different in terms of quantity. I'm not sure I know what you mean by quality. Well, in terms of the types of data you might be able to recover. Yeah, I guess in terms of if you mean like what could be of value to an investigation, then yeah, absolutely. In addition to that, as I understand your, your testimony, uh, some vehicles uh, overwrite their data quicker than other vehicles, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, if the, the data can be overwritten quickly, th there's no way for us to know exactly uh, how long data is going to be on a drive before it's overwritten. You were asked a couple of questions about uh, why some data might not be uh, recoverable. Do you remember those questions? I do, yeah. And you mentioned uh, corrupted uh, sectors on the... Uh, Yes, there on were the there on the were, chip, right? Yes, there were some bad sectors on this chip. If, if we're talking about the Ford F one fifty Raptor, yeah. right? Well, when you speak, so that we all understand, because I'm I'm trying to understand this. The chip is like, it, we're talking about a computer chip, right? Yes, a memory chip. It's it's really similar to like flash memory, the type of memory you would get in like a USB data stick that we're all familiar with. Yes. Except instead of being in a removable stick like that, this piece of memory is physically soldered to a motherboard inside the system because it, it was never intended to be removed. Do some vehicles allow the owner of the vehicle to turn off certain data for privacy reasons? Um, I'm not aware of too many. It's hard for me to answer that because I'm. You, you would have to go into the if you go into the user interface of the infotainment system. There are options in there that can be changed. Um, Isn't but, GP? Uh, that, uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt. I didn't know you were. I'm not familiar with what the options are in every make and model of vehicle. So, for example, on your iPhone, you can put a phone in. Um, airplane mode, or you can turn off GPS location data, correct? Correct. Don't some vehicles allow you to do that as well? They may. I'm not aware of any. Have you ever looked into it? Uh, no. Now you also indicated that um, GPS data is spotty, I think is the word you used for the particular for the Ford Raptor, correct? It's spotty in the sense that some time frames are missing, yes. Could I have the two exhibits, please? And when you say spotty, you mean there certain data is just missing, correct? Correct. You were not able to determine whether it was due to somebody intentionally uh, deleting or turning off the data or due to uh, just insufficient memory or uh, a glitch, you said it was a corrupted sector, right? You don't know. Um, well, in terms of someone intentionally shutting off the GPS, I, I, I would expect the entire day to be missing if someone did that. I wouldn't expect to have, uh, you know, random points of data from that day appearing. Unless somebody intentionally turned it off and then turned it on again, right? Um, I guess. I, I can't That's say possible, that. right? 
I'm not sure if it's possible. I don't know. I would have to examine the Ford F-150 uh, Raptor and its interface to see if there's even a setting for that. I, I'm not sure. All right. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask you about, well, before I put this on, I asked you a few questions during an earlier set of questions. Remember I was asking about the map you prepared, correct? Right? I remember. Yeah. My memory's and, going, but it's, it's not that bad yet. And um, there's a red dot and a green dot, and then occasionally there looks like a light green dot that's different colors. Are these colors that you added, or was this in the infotainment system when you downloaded the data? Those are in the infotainment system. And the red dot is where it stopped, the vehicle stopped? What does the red dot mean? Uh, generally, it means a different way that the data was collected. I had mentioned earlier, if you recall, that d data can be collected as uh, part of a um, vehicle track or as part of a vehicle event. And I believe that generally the red dots represent a vehicle event and the green dots repre represent from data from a track log. Or it, could, they're both... it could be the other way around. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I have to check. All right, so I'm gonna ask you and um, you'll, if all of us don't, aren't the greatest when it comes to uh, Elmo's here, so I'm just going to um, turn this on, I hope, unless it just needs, can we have this, the monitor? The cap. Oh, the cap. <laughs> Technology. All right. So um, I know that there is a zoom feature here that I've practiced with, so let me just zoom down a bit here. And I think it's autofocus. It should. All right. So when we're talking about using this as an example, there's the red dot and then the green dot, correct? Mm -hmm. That's a yes, right? Yes, correct. Um, but you can't tell whether the data was from uh, which source that created, <coughs> bless you, that created this particular image, right? I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but if it were critical for your case, I could go back and review the data and answer that question. Well, I'm not going to ask you to do that now. Okay. So can one tell by just looking at this whether the vehicle moved from the red spot to the green spot or the green spot to the red spot during the time it, it, at issue here, which is? If I recall correctly, it moved from the green spot to the red spot. But again, I would have to go back and review the data to confirm that. I, I didn't think it would be something that was relevant. so I. Don't recall it off the top of my head. You also are aware, you know something about uh, geolocation data, correct? Yes, I read, being that I testify about it on occasion, I've, I've read a few scientific papers about it. Yeah. So you know that there's a, uh, somewhere between a 10 and a 15% uh, uh, accuracy differentiation for the location, the pinpoint location, right? From the satellites? Object. Well, From, the, yes. well, the I, Sean I, Horn said 10 or 15 percent. Court does not know whether he meant percent or feet. Oh, okay. Well, the pinpoint can be off up to, well, I'm, I can't do the math myself, so I'll just say that there is an accuracy rate of 85 percent, correct? Uh, I'm not familiar with any study that reports that. If you could refer me to it, I would look into it. I, that sounds high to me. Well, in any event, you said that the range, we, even within a, um, you, you're dealing with longitude and latitude, correct? Correct. And there's anywhere from, I think you said, 16 to maybe, what, 20 feet uh, mobility area for that? I said 16. Exactly 16 feet? I, I once read a, a paper that uh, reported uh, accuracy within 16 feet from satellite data. But 16 feet is a circumference, correct? Correct. A circle. 16 foot radius. Radius, well. Or a 16 foot circumference. Circumference, right. So um, the reason I ask that is um, I look at one of these. For example, on page, well, there, these pages aren't numbered, so I'll just refer you to the fact that at the top it says, 503 to 505, and then it says, do you see that 538 to 6 p.m.? Do you see that there? Mm -hmm. I, for the record, I'm going to have to ask you to say yes or no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I okay. see. And um, if we look at this particular 
uh, image, if this is Jefferson Crossing as it's identified, it shows a red dot here as being the location at the time of 5.38 to 6 p.m., correct? That's correct. On that date. But if I look at the next page, rather uh, the last page, second last page, you recognize this is still the same structure, the same house on Jefferson Crossing, right? Yes, I, I believe it is, yes. Right, and it shows that uh, there's some kind of movement um, from a uh, spot. Yes, I remember spot. this one because I animated this track log. It went from the green dot to the red dot. Yeah, but you do know that, um, are you familiar, did you ever look at a satellite image of this uh, property? I have not. Because uh, would this not, if, if I were to tell you that this is all lawn on this side of the house there, is it suggesting that the, that this vehicle drove onto the lawn to the side of the house? I would say yes, you probably. Would. Yeah. All right, if it was 16 to tw 16 feet between there and let's say the corner of the house, might it just be that much inaccurate? You know, um, I don't believe so. Like I said, in, in my experience, and I've done a lot of these cases, and a lot of, I've seen a lot of these GPS dots from this Burl Ivy software um, substantiated in video surveillance evidence. And in my experience, it's, it's been spot on. Um, you know, if you want to call an expert in here in terms of satellite uh, GPS data and, and points that, that could contradict that, that, I mean, that's up to you. But in my experience, I, I have no reason to believe the data is ever that inaccurate. So if this is lawn over here, you're testifying that this truck at 8.14 p.m. drove onto the lawn on the side of the house, correct? Yes, I am. Okay. I believe that that probably happened. All right. While I'm on this page, I wanted to ask you, I'm going to turn this. Um, you were asked questions about what these words mean and the track log data, mm -hmm. and uh, you indicated adjusted means um, that you adjusted the time from what would be uh, UTC or Greenwich Mean Time, London time, to local time in Farmington, Connecticut. Correct. <coughs> correct. And um, did you? And what is the EST? Does that mean you estimated it? No, that means Eastern Standard Time. So, what would that do to your calculation since this was in Eastern Daylight Time? Oh yeah, you're right. That it was in Eastern Daylight Time, so EST is a mistake. It should have been EDT. So, so you you wrote this. This is data that came off the. the machine. No, that data came off the machine, but when I create the time change, it asks me to name it, and I mistakenly named it EST instead of EDT. So it's not that the infotainment system has the wrong time, it's that you physically made an uh, incorrect uh, calculation is what you're saying. No, and, I'm not saying the calculation's incorrect. Entry. I'm saying that the S is a typo, it should be a D. Oh, okay. Could you also, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions about the... Uh, one of the other pages here, if I may, and I'm going to go to page two. And you can see this from where you're seated, right? You don't need to look at the screen behind you, correct? That's correct. I can see it on the monitor. So you indicated that um, this report on page two indicated that at May 24th, 2019, at 7.55 a.m., this vehicle was at, that the Ford Raptor was at a house located at 27 Spring Lane, Simsbury, correct? Yes, that's correct. And again, I just want to be clear, the report didn't mention that 27 Spring Lane was a house. This is something you wrote, right? Yes, I wrote that. That's correct. Okay. And the one and then the next one right below it you see says 9:53 a.m. to 12:30 p.m. It's at a house at 61 Sturbridge Hill Road. You see that? Yes. So was there any data between 7:55 a.m. and 9:53 a.m. that you were able to recover? No, I was not able to recover any data within that time frame. 
And when you say from 9.53 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., was the data constant? That means every five minutes or every minute you were able to... No, I believe there were... I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I, no, but... I believe there were three points of data in that time frame that had the vehicle in the same location. Can you tell me what those times data were? Yes. Or uh, data times, excuse me. They would be at the end of this document. Okay. Let's see, that started at what time? 9.50? 9.53 a.m. On 5.24. Yes. Just tell me what page it's on so I could follow along. I'm on the second to last page. Second to last page. And I'm looking at the track log data at the bottom. And you can see that recovered item number 39 is the first one. And it shows a time range of 9.53 to 9.54. The second one is number 40, shows 1221 to 1222. And the third one is, uh, shows a time frame of 1230, 26 seconds to 1230, 44 seconds. And those are the only three points of data uh, from that Sturbridge Hill Road in New Canaan. Can you see that? Yeah, I think. That I was maybe on the wrong page when you did that. So let me just see if I understand. You're referring to, are you referring to the left column or the right column for that, or both? Um, if you if you'd show, the, uh, show the jury, please. So the first one is recovered number 39, 524.19, um, 953 to 954. That data point shows on the map as that Sturbridge Hill in New Canaan. That's one data point. One data two? point. Okay. Number 40 is the second data point. It shows the same date, 12.21.53 p.m. to 12.22 p.m. Again, the exact same spot in Sturbridge Hill. Is it Sturbridge Hill Road? Yes. Okay. And then the last one right below that, number 41, 2019, 12.30.26 to 12.30.44. Um, some type of vehicle event happened that recorded that data spot. So I have, I have three data spots recorded for that location on that day. So do you have any way of knowing what happened between 9.54 a.m. and 12.21 p.m.? I'm sorry, I do not have any way of knowing. Other, well, so, I don't want to say it. Right. I'd be speculating if that's not appropriate. Okay. So, so when you say in your report 9.53 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., you cannot testify that the vehicle was there that entire time, can you? I cannot say with certainty that it was. Now, the other thing I'm going to ask you about is this green dot is also showing the, uh, the vehicle parked on, uh, in a uh, lawn or an and not on a driveway, correct? Yeah, um, this is the map version. If I, I, I displayed this data in the satellite version so I could see more accurately, mm -hmm. I can't see exactly where it's parked because there's a large tree canopy there that kind of covers it. But the driveway is the entire width of the house structure there. And it appears that the vehicle is parked just off the driveway surface in, in the satellite view. And I'm just gonna ask you just hypothetically, if uh, the person who said they were driving that vehicle indicated they always parked in the same spot on the driveway when they were down there, uh, would that impact at all your estimate of where, whether or not that dot is off by as many as 15 or 16 feet? Um, I mean, in the satellite view, it shows it pretty close to the driveway surface, so it could be off by a few feet, but I, I don't think too many. Right. But in terms of whether or not it's, not it's showing this vehicle parked behind the house, not on the driveway, you can't say that that's pinpoint accuracy. I definitely cannot say it's pinpoint accuracy. Okay. That's true. Well, this is probably then, a best time to take the morning recess. Ladies and gentlemen, we will stand in our morning recess and please do not discuss the case.
Court is now open and back in session. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. We can bring the jury in, please. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Newth, uh, so that I understand correctly, the um, infotainment system does not run. 24-7, whether the, whether the card's running or not, correct? Correct. It's an electronic device. It needs power in order to run, so there needs to be power to it. So you either have to, in, in most cards, that means turn the engine on, right? Yeah, it's not necessarily to turn the engine fully on. You can turn the key uh, so that it activates the battery and alternator, and it will power up the system. But okay. Now you're referring to older cards that actually have a key, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. All right. So newer cars, you either you know push a button to push activate the, the car, or you can I guess put on what they used to call it an accessory to to, a, to turn on the batteries. So you listen to the radio or correct something yes. like that. But there does have to be power to the system, which often means the car needs to be the engine needs to be started. Right. And so when we're looking at the um, uh, the events and the times in your report, those are times when the engine had to be at least activated, if not turned on, correct? Correct. So according to um, your data and in your report, on May 24th, we're going back, 7.55 a.m. is when the, it, it, unless it was corrupted, that's the time that the car was turned on, or at least the power was given to the system, right? Yeah, if I remember right, that was a gear shift um, uh, vehicle event. I, I believe the gear uh, was, car was shifted into gear. Oh, so you're able to even tell what the car is doing when the system goes on? If a vehicle event is recorded, you're able to tell. Oh, okay. So then the next uh, time there was an event was at 9.53 a.m. at Sturbridge Hill Road, correct? Uh, correct. You don't know what that event was? I believe it was shifted to park. Okay. But I, you know what, I shouldn't say that. I, I would have to double check the data because I didn't save that. And you don't have but that I, with you, do you? I don't think I have that with me. I would have to double check that for you. That's, my recollection when I read this and put it together is that was a vehicle shift to park. Okay. But I would have to confirm, I'd confirm that to be completely certain. All right, if I'm to look at your uh, last two pages of your report that has the, uh, what I'll call the more, the less uh, visual data, right? The other times that you mentioned in the morning would require at that time at, um, let's say, 9.53 a.m., you said was a shift to park? 
I believe it was. Uh, yeah, that was the arrival. I believe it was. And then the car was engaged, or at least the power went on at 12:21 in 59 seconds, right? Um, yes, yeah, something occurred at that time. I'm not sure what, but something occurred for the vehicle to record a data point. Okay. When you say something, it means the power got turned on, right? It, yes, it could mean that. Well, it couldn't happen while the car is off and somebody's out of the car, could it? Yes, if, if there's no activity around the vehicle and the vehicle's powered down, it won't record a data point. And of course, um, you check to see if there were any recorded activities from, I think, 1233 to the next one you indicated was at 421. This is uh, Interstate 84, is it not here, the curve? Yes. In Plainville, heading at, near Farmington, correct? Correct. <clears throat> and there, to answer your question, no data points were recovered between those two time frames. I see, but this one shows a red dot and a green dot traveling. Can you tell from your map which direction the vehicle is going or no? Um, if I believe the, the vehicle is going, if I recall, from, from the green dot in the lower part of the picture to the red dot in the upper corner of the picture. I could certainly double check that for you. Um, simply, when, when I open the extraction, if I put the cursor on one dot, it'll show me the timestamp for that dot, and then put it on the other dot, and it'll show me the timestamp. So obviously, it's going in the direction of the earlier timestamp to the later timestamp. Fair enough. <coughs> so let me, let me just make sure I didn't have another question about um, the Ford Raptor. So let me now talk to you about the Chevy Suburban. Um, okay. You were asked a bunch of questions just now about the, um, the report as it applied to the 2017 Chevrolet, Chevrolet Suburban, correct? That's correct. And you showed us some information that uh, was obtained and downloaded by you? That's correct. You didn't prepare a um, map-like report like we just saw for the Ford Raptor, correct? Yes, that's because I didn't get any GPS data from the, the dates of interest, the 23rd and 24th of May 2019. At all? At all. And you don't know, or do you know whether or not the uh, just the GPS had been either by, by a, an auto uh, place like Chevrolet or by the customer had been shut off so they could not be tracked where they were going? I do not know the answer to that, and I, I'm not sure if that specific system records a lot of GPS data. Oh, okay. Now, um, in addition to the report that, we, that was just introduced as, as State's Exhibit 130, you had, in 2019, prepared another report, didn't you, regarding the Chevy Suburban? Um, I re I re um, prepared a report with several attachments to it relating to this extraction, yes. And in fact, uh, you sent that directly to a uh, state police detective named Kimball, didn't you? Uh, probably. I can remember emailing one of the state police detectives about uh, this. If I showed you uh, your email, might that refresh your recollection? I'm sure it would, yeah. Showing you exhibit N for identification. And it's a Nancy. Is that your email? Oh, yes. This is my email uh, dated 5-30-2019 to Detective John Kimball. So you wrote this email in, uh, uh, on May 30th, 2019? Yes, I did. Had you already reviewed the Chevy Suburban material as of that date? Uh, yes, I did. What was going on at this time is this was an active investigation and it was considered very high priority. And the detectives wanted to know right away if any data was recovered from the 23rd or 24th so that they could utilize that data in their investigation. So when I found some data from the 24th in this extraction, I let De Detective Kimball know about it. 
And they specifically did want to know about uh, the movements or the tracking of Jennifer Doulis's cell phone, correct? No, I did not have Jennifer Doulis's cell phone. I, I did not examine that. I only examined her vehicle. You were asked to determine if there were any cell phones that had paired to the vehicle, though, correct? Well, not specifically. I was asked to provide any data recorded by the vehicle that occurred within that date range. And you did that, right? Yes, I did. And you prepared a report to give to Detective Kimball, correct? Yes, I did. Please do. Showing you what has been marked as exhibit CC for identification is the summary report what you gave to Detective Kimball in response or in attention to that PDF that you mentioned was connected to your email. Um, yes, this is related to the, de the, the device connection that was identified as occurring on 524 2019. And my question is that, what was the PDF that came with Exhibit N, right? Oh, uh, yes, I believe these are, the email is related to this piece of data. I would offer both N and CC as full. Oh, I have no objection, Your Honor. I would just ask counsel to get me a copy. Thank you. Uh, Thank defense you. N and Defense CC admitted as full. Just for the jury's edification, I'm just going to show them. Uh, this is Exhibit N, and um, it's a photocopy, but this is the email you sent to Detective Kimball with one attachment on May 30th, 2019 at, I can't tell if, what, if it's 3.23 or 5.23, but. It's 5.23 p.m., it looks like. Yeah, but it was that date. Or it could be 3.23, you're right. It's kind of, but it was definitely that date. Um, okay. And the attachment was something called uh, case details search after 523 2019, correct? Yes. Uh, let me explain if you like. The sure, but I, let me first identify this is exhibit oh, sure. CC, correct? Yes, CC. All right. So would you explain the purpose of preparing this document? Yeah, this is an overall, this is an excerpt, I, th I think, from an overall PDF. <laughs> when I do a Burla data extraction, Burla has a tool where you can create a PDF case report right away. And it's that enormous PDF that the state's attorney was asking me about earlier that's so many, you know, over a thousand pages. But it contains all the data that's extract extracted from the vehicle. And um, as part of our policy, once I complete the extraction, I usually will email that PDF report to whoever the investigating officer is so that they have that data immediately. <coughs> because a lot of times these are done during active investigations and they're looking for this information to find leads to follow in their investigation. So immediately when the extraction's done, I create the PDF, I email it out. 
And so there, you're talking about there's a thousand page report, right? It could be that big, yes. And, and I don't know the number of pages of this report, but I'm sure it's quite large. And it's all uh, data. It's a lot right. of it's raw data, correct? Well, it, it's in data that's interpreted into plain English by the software, but it is it is the raw data as having not been gone through or uh, by investigative eyes. Well, just like the um, map report that we just saw that you prepared uh, for the state, yes. there's a this is a summary of some of the data in that thousand pages. Correct. It's oh. a summary of some of that data. All right. So I'm just going to go through it with you. So sure. up at the top. It mentions uh, the uh, year and model and the VIN number of the, of the vehicle, correct? Yes, correct. Were you made aware during your conversations, you said it was a high priority case, correct? Yes, it was. So, so you knew that it had to do with the disappearance of a woman by the name of Jennifer Dulos that the police were investigating, right? I was aware of that, yes. Okay. And you were also aware that this was her vehicle, correct? Yes. Um, obviously, the evidence can't be submitted to me without a search warrant. And before I do my examination, I always read the search warrant, which gives me a lot of information about the case, but it helps me know what, what type of data I'm looking for. Obviously. Okay. So um, I'm just going to ask you, there's a section here, and I'm going to zoom out a little just so that it all fits on one page. And I'll move it down, but would you indicate for the jury what the call logs here show? Yeah, um, call logs are basically, they come from the cell phone. The, when the cell phone is connected to the system via Bluetooth, the system immediately downloads, like I had testified to earlier, immediately downloads data from your cell phone relating to phone calls, including contacts and phone call history. So the call logs are phone call history downloaded by the infotainment system from the cell phone when it's connected. And are these times uh, local time or UTC time that are included in your report? Well, if you look at the second column, it says timestamp, type, and it says local. So this device uh, displayed the time in local time, not in UTC. The next... Um, uh, column talks about call type outgoing versus missed, correct? Correct. And then the uh, next is phone numbers. Yes. Right? And then the next column are contact names. Where would those names have come from? Well, let me ask it a different way. Just, are these the names that the holder of this phone, that is the owner of this particular phone, would have punched into their phone as an identification to the uh, who the, if they were known recipients or senders, or does the system itself create that? Those names come from the contact list in the phone. When, I mean, every, most everybody has a cell phone, right? You have a list of contacts, and you can go to the contact you want to call and push it in. The contact list is downloaded along with the cell phone data when the connection is made. And the system, when a phone call is made, if it recognizes that number as one of your contacts, it's going to display that contact name along with that call. So when you see those names on there, Gloria Farber, Dwayne Lavold, those are from the contact list in that phone. Now, you did not have the phone in question here, did you? I did not. So the, de so the device identifier, is this what you testify to on direct would be the um, Bluetooth identifier, or would that be the serial number of the phone itself? Um, the MAC number, I think you referred to. It's the Bluetooth MAC address is what Burla tends to use as their device identifier. And the reason, I, I think the I shouldn't speak for Burla, but I believe the reason they use that is all these connections are made via Bluetooth, so it's, it's a unique piece of data that's readily available in the extraction. Is it called MAC because it's an Apple uh, no. device, just MAC, or what is it? Just MAC. And yeah. do we know what that stands for? Do you know what that stands for? I'd, I'd have to look it up. I don't recall. Right. But it's but an it's, abbreviation for something. Yes. It's similar to an IP address. It's a unique address, uh, uh, address for each device in order to make uh, a connection through Bluetooth. Would you have made a determination that this device identifier uh, was connected to the... Uh, 
or came back to the device registered to Jennifer Dulles? I don't know who this device is registered to. I know the date and time, the date and time it was first paired to this device, and I know that the last date and time it was paired to this device. Um, it's a device that was just called iPhone. Um, so I, I don't have any ownership auth authentication to it within this data extraction. But uh, just in looking at the contact names, there was a Dr. Roy Geronimus who was called at 7.54 a.m. outgoing from this device while paired to this Chevrolet, correct? Well, it's correct that there was an outgoing call made from that cell phone to a Dr. Roy Geronimus at 7.54.41 a.m. There's no data here to tell me whether or not that phone call occurred from within the vehicle. Some systems record that uh, phone call made within vehicle. This system does not. That phone call could have been made outside the vehicle, and then when the device connected, it downloaded phone call history, and so the data is in there. But it doesn't tell me whether or not it was made from the car or from outside the car. I don't know. Well, and the next call is, uh, I, I guess these are in uh, the next call earlier, rather, the, the evening before, May 23rd, was to somebody named Caroline Luft. You see that? I do. And then there was a... Uh, you mentioned the other two people, one being Gloria Farber and one being Dwayne LaVold, correct? Correct. So if one were to go through the phone records of an individual, determine whether these calls, in fact, were occurred, one could match up that phone, so-called iPhone, to the uh, particular uh, device if there were phone records to do that, right? Objection. Yes. Cause for speculation outside the scope. About phone records. Well, this witness has not testified concerning phone, well, phone records or basically those records generated by the phone company. So the question is would the information contained on the uh, call logs also show up on phone records generated by the company. That's the question, correct? Yes. Overruled. I think you answered yes. Yes, I believe it would. Okay. Now, the next column here, you uh, have in Fox here called events. Are these the times that, when you say uh, that the device pair to the Chevrolet, specific Chevrolet Suburban on May 24th, 2019, according to this report. Yeah, if you look at the bottom one on this report, the date on the left shows 5-24-19, 2-56-32 p.m., that's local time. The event is identified as a device, and the action is identified as a device connection. So um, it's reporting a device connection of the unique uh, identifier with that Bluetooth MAC address, 5C09, et cetera, was connected at that time. And I know if you go to the event identifier, this uh, MAC number that you identified that begins 5C0, et cetera, you right. see that? that? That number is unique to each individual cell phone. Is that the same identifier as shown under the call logs in the previous box on that same page? Uh, 5C09, C184. Yes, it is. So can we conclude from this events box that the specific device, the one that either missed or sent phone calls in call logs box, connected to the Chevrolet Suburban at 2.56 and 32, minute, uh, 32 seconds p.m. on May 24th, 2019? Yes, that's correct. I realize, um, Your Honor, there are three copies of the same document. I did make copies after when I stapled them, so I can give a 
copy to council, if I may. Yes. Is it just one page? Yeah. If you want to take the other one off. Yeah. So it's Now, if a vehicle um, has been paired with a, uh, well, is which way does it go? Does the phone pair with the vehicle, look through Bluetooth, or does the Bluetooth and the vehicle pair with the phone? Which way does that work? Uh, both. I mean, the two, the two devices have to be set into pairing mode together and be within range of each other in order to pair them. So it's a very deliberate act. So in other words, the, one has to, it's, it's not just by accident, you can't be driving down the street and accidentally pair with someone's, a total stranger's vehicle's uh, Bluetooth, correct? Correct. And the device uh, MAC number that you testify to remains the same as long as you own that, it remains the same for that device, correct? For that device. If you get a new device, you have to pair it all over again because it'll be a different uh, MAC number, right? Yes, that's correct. And each car has a different uh, infotainment center uh, system that has its own unique identifier as well, correct? That's correct. And once you've paired your device to a vehicle, um, will it stay there unless you erase it? Um, yes, I believe it will. Um, it doesn't, that list is pretty consistent. Um, what it usually records is the initial date of the pairing and then the last date that it, it was re, uh, connected at. Every time you connect it, it changes that last date of connection to the current date. So you don't know every time that it connected, you know the initial time and the last time. Well, for example, if, if I were to pair to a rental car and then I forget to delete that. Would that my pairing remain there? So the next time I'm I go to that rental company, will I pair again? There's yes, I believe it would. So it would be. I mean, this is not really vehicle. Uh, so just for our edification, so it'd be good to delete it on your own. You can actually delete the Bluetooth uh, pairing from a vehicle if you want to, right? Uh, I, most of them allow that in the user interface. I believe. Okay. And you did testify that um, as new data is entered in, older data is deleted, correct? If, if what, what I said was, if data is marked as deleted by the system, as new data is recorded, that deleted data may become overwritten and then it's no longer accessible to us. Well, for example, you, were you able to retrieve any earlier phone calls that aren't in this report from the uh, infotainment center, from the Bluetooth connection to that device? Um, I believe there's a lot of phone calls in the, in the full report of this extraction, but they don't relate to the time frame of interest. That was what I was gonna, so you, would, you were asked in this report by the detective to only limit it to the May 23rd to May 24th period, correct? Yeah, for their investigation at the time, they were interested in anything that occurred around the time of Mrs. Dulos's disappearance. Now, you were asked some questions about uh, Bluetooth uh, distance. Do you remember those questions? I do. Does it matter whether a window or a door to a vehicle is open or closed, what the distance is going to be to the, uh, from the device to the vehicle itself? In my experience, no. It'll go through a closed door or window. And the range you said is what? How far away can you be before? I don't have a scientific answer to this. I, I mean, I have a personal analogy. What's your analogy? One time I was in the tire shop getting new tires and my wife called me and I'm sitting in the waiting room talking to my wife and the mechanic comes in and says, hey, we can hear your call on the phone's radio. Um, and that, I had to be a good 50 feet away from where the car was being worked on. So 50 it's a pretty good range. 50 feet. 
Yeah, I bet I was. And there were a, was there a wall or glass between you as well? A wall with a closed door, yes. Okay. How long does the um, vehicle store the Bluetooth data? In terms of the connected devices, I don't believe that that gets marked for deletion unless someone manually goes in and, and deletes it. So it can go back maybe years? I believe so, yeah. yeah I, in fact, I'm sure I've seen connected devices going back a few years, yeah. Is that one of the reasons the report is a thousand pages here? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. There's a lot of data in these things. And, I mean, most of it is irrelevant to your investigation, but it's there and it's recovered, so. And just like I asked you about the Ford, uh, does the vehicle have to be turned on, or at least the uh, power turned on, in order for the Bluetooth system to work with that vehicle? Yes, it does. It's an electronic device. Without power, it can't do anything. The phone itself, however, connects to the, the, the let, let me re-ask re this question. I want to understand this part. The, um, is the phone call, it's the phone receiving and sending phone uh, calls through the car system? In other words, is the car connecting to a cell tower or is it the phone itself? Well, the car is capable of connecting to a cell tower if it has cellular service. You would have to buy cellular service for the car though. I mean, it's the cell phone primarily that's connecting. It, the cell phone is connected to the cellular network and to the infotainment system through Bluetooth. Um, but the actual connection is being made in the cell phone. So when it comes to, uh, are you, were you able to tell whether in this particular case and in this uh, report that the Bluetooth connection was more just as like a wireless speakers. In other words, it was a hands-free availability that would connect so you could hear things like you just explained. Correct, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's for the purpose of hands-free driving. It, but the, the phone is what's doing the act, making the actual connection to the outside phone. But other than that, the cell phone itself would have to connect to cell tower service, correct? Yes. Did this vehicle, when you examined it, have a hotspot or an internal cellular ability so that you could make calls from the car rather than use your own cell data? Um, I do not believe it did. A cell phone would have had to have been present to make a call. Can I just have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, one final question. After you uh, sent this material to Detective Kimball, did, he, did you speak to him to help explain any of this data to him? Um, I can't recall speaking. I, I mean, I can't say for sure that I didn't. It was five years ago. But I don't recall having that conversation. OK. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. <laughs> Just briefly, if I can. Um, sir, just a couple more questions. Thank sure. you. Uh, just a couple questions on the uh, on Bluetooth and the the capabilities. Attorney Shohan asked you a couple questions about um, the location and whether the door had to be open. Do you recall that line of questions? I do. All right, and you um, told the story about at the car wash. The tire shop. The tire shop. <laughs> there you go. Tire shop. Um, and there was a wall between you and the car. Yes, I was in a waiting room. The car was in the garage getting new tires put on it. What about if a, um, there were trees in between a, a phone device and a vehicle that was running? Would, that, would the phone be able to connect to the, to the Bluetooth of the car? I mean, it's not like I've done any scientific studies on it, but in my personal experience, I would say the trees would not affect it. Bushes? Probably not. Okay, people walking? No. Okay. 
If the phone was just around and in an area close to the- If to it's the... within a close enough distance to the system, if both the phone and the system are powered on, it's gonna connect. Okay. And um, council asked you about deleting the pairing of the phone off of the vehicle. Do you recall that line of questioning? I do, yeah. And is that something a person can manually do? Yeah. I think I've done that before on some of my old cars. You can go in and you can cancel your pairing mm -hmm. and then repair it if you want to or can you also cancel the location services of that of the infotainment center? I'm not aware of I don't know how to answer that. I'm not aware of any way that you can do that, but without researching it, I can't say with certainty. Okay. And a couple of questions, if you can. Um, if I may just approach the clerk, Your Honor. It's 129. Sir, briefly. Attorney Schoenhorn asked you about the movement of the vehicle, particularly uh, Sturbridge Hill. Yes, I remember. Okay. And you indicated that you, there were three data points that you found uh, during that time period, 9.53 and 12.30, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, with respect to those three data points, did the vehicle move from that spot at those three specific times? Uh, it did not appear to. Those three specific data points are right on top of each other. I mean, there's no separation in those circles. So if the vehicle moved at that time, it was parked again in the exact same location. I mean, quite precisely. Okay. And if you look at page one of that report, you actually have the vehicle moving at Jefferson Crossing. Um, in a very small spot. Is yes. That correct? So that would be the show of the movement from a vehicle from one place to another. Correct. And with respect to Sturbridge Hill, though, the spots remain in the exact same spot? Correct. That's and just one single data point. One day. And this road here, um, up and down, you titled that Sturbridge Hill Road. Is that the main road? And then is this, and my next question would just follow up, and then does that make this the driveway? Yes, Sturbridge Hill is the road, and that line there that leads to the house is the driveway. And the dot behind the house would be the vehicle? Correct. Oh, one last question, actually. I'm sorry. I just wanted to see if I could clarify. On that same States 129, um, you indicated on, on cross-examination the EST was just a typo. It's supposed to be EDT, is that correct? Yeah, you know, sometimes I'm not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. I, I should have wrote e, EDT because it is summertime, so it would be Eastern Daylight Time. But the times that, that in the date reflected? It, the time reflects a minus four hour correction, which is accurate for summertime or daylight so time. It's really, it's just a typo. The times are not inaccurate. The times are accurate. The EST is my stupid mistake. I I just want to clarify on what you were just shown on exhibit one twenty nine, if you would uh you look at that, um, there, are, there were three, I guess we call them event times listed at the top, 452, 505, oh, four, 452, 505, 509, and 510, is that right? Yes. This, this diagram isn't showing that between those times the vehicle only moved, like this, this, this blue line is not showing that it moved from the red dot to the green dot or the green dot to the red dot, does it? Yeah, usually the, the blue line indicates the motion of the vehicle. And it took, according to this, um, maybe um, 18 minutes to move 
what, six feet, 10 feet? Yeah, I mean, not all of the data is present, so we don't know um, exactly when it moved between those two points of data. So, because um, I wanted to ask, it, there's been testimony in this case that this vehicle went to other addresses in Avon and Farmington during this very time that's indicated here. Do you have any data that shows that it was um, at another location? All the data that I recovered is present in this document. So, I, and, and data that occurred at times that I did not recover from, I, I can't testify to, I don't know. So um, I'm going to ask you, is it possible that what this is showing is that this vehicle started up at this location, traveled elsewhere, came back to this location at Jefferson Crossing, and maybe was turned on a second time? It's hard for me to answer that because you're asking me to testify by, about data that I did not recover. So I can't, I can't really do that. Well, if I had the, those data points, I'd be happy to point it out to you. but. I can only show you, I have these two data points. A blue line indicates usually that there's motion with Verla, um, but that's all, that's all I was able to recover. So as far as you know, there's no data about this vehicle being at an address on uh, Deer Cliff Road in Avon, correct? That you recovered? Um, it, it, wasn't it driving along Deer Cliff in one of these? Point of data. I think that name Deercliff sounds familiar. I think it was. Was that that was on? Uh... Uh, go to go to the last data point of the day. Didn't it drive along Deercliff, or am I wrong? <coughs> What's the last one on the second to last page? Oh, okay. Yeah, it shows at. Yeah, Deercliff Road. Right. Eight o'clock at night, driving on Deercliff Road. Right. Yeah, 8 o'clock at night. All right. Um, what about at, um, on May 23rd? I don't think I recovered it on Deer Cliff Road on, on May 23rd. And was there any, what about 80 Mountain Spring Road? Was there any data recovered that this vehicle traveled to 80 Mountain Spring Road on the 23rd? I don't recall any of that, no. I have no further questions. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. Mr. Newth, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Your Honor, the state would call Detective Mike Clark. shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you battle upon penalty of perjury. I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. My name is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, last name Clark, C-L-A-R-K. Thank you. And sir, you may be stated. Thank you. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. Uh, by whom are you employed? By? I'm employed by the Fairfield Police Department. And in what capacity? I'm currently in the capacity of police detective. How long have you been a Fairfield Police Detective? I've been a Fairfield Police Detective since 2016. Are you assigned to a particular division or department within the Fairfield Police Department? Yes, yeah, so I, I'm assigned to the Detective Bureau. 
um, and I currently work um, in that function doing uh, cyber investigations. I manage our cold case homicide investigations. Uh, I manage all of our digital investigative technology, as well as being a qualified forensic examiner, digital forensic examiner for the agency. And what is a digital forensic examiner? So a summary of, of what a digital forensic examiner would do, um, I assist with the initial acquisition of uh, digital devices and digital data, um, and then the preservation of those devices and that data. Um, following proper legal procedure um, or sufficient search authority, I would conduct extraction of digital devices um, and the data contained within. Um, and then I would work with an investigator to look through that data and determine whether there was anything, um, any evidence related to their case or any exculpatory information related to their case as well. When you say digital data, um, what are, essentially, we're talking about computers and cell phones and other electronic <clears throat> devices, is that correct? Uh, a digital device, yes, would be a cell phone or computer or tablet or something capable of storing digital data. I'm going to direct your attention primarily to cell phones when I ask you these questions. Is that OK? Yes. OK, could you just briefly maybe ex explain a little bit about your training and experience to become a digital forensic examiner, particularly with respect to cell phones? Sure. Um, so aside from being a police detective and having extensive training and experience in criminal investigations, um, I also have three certifications through Celebrite, which is one of the leading digital forensics companies in the world. Those certifications are as a physical operator, physical analyst, and also a uh, certified mobile examiner. Um, I've also been to the NCFI in Alabama, which is the Secret Service Training Facility for Digital Forensics, and I've taken multiple classes through the NCFI in cyber investigations. I also spent uh, two years as a task force officer in the Federal Bureau of Investigation doing cyber investigations there and attaining uh, secret and top secret security clearance during my time. And three years in a digital forensics lab uh, known as the TIU, which was sponsored by the Secret Service and focuses on, again, digital forensics. I have training uh, through the FBI in uh, the analysis of location data via cellular towers and digital devices, and also how to um, map those on, on a program to be able to view them. Uh, I also have training and experience in utilizing video editing software to make uh, court-ready presentations or presentations for media dissemination, uh, as well as having attended many different seminars and, uh, and classes uh, in continuing education in this career path. Now, you mentioned the uh, Technical Investigative Unit at TIU. Yes. Can you just briefly explain where is that located and what does it do? Sure. So the TIU is a, is a lab in Weston. Um, it's manned by detectives, officers, um, different ranks of people that are all digital forensics individuals. And um, it, it's a lab where you know, they can take a, a larger amount of digital devices from different places. They have access to different tools and they'd be able to conduct extractions or analysis of uh, other devices. Were you a member of TIU? I was. Now, um, you mentioned a couple terms. I'm going to ask you to define them a little bit, if you can. Uh, you just mentioned extraction. What does that mean? Yeah, so I have a simple way to explain an extraction. Um, so we mentioned digital devices being something like a phone. And phones um, contain digital data, so the data that's stored on those phones. So what an extraction does, um, I would util utilize a tool or a program to be able to remove or copy the data, is a better term, to copy the data from a digital device and to move it to a different place where it's created, uh, it creates this packet of data known as a zip file. And uh, it would later allow me to parse that data to be able to view what was on the device. What are some of the tools that you utilize to assist you in ex extracting the data? Primarily, I utilize um, GrayKey, which is an extraction software, as well as uh, Celebrite UFED for PC, which is also an extraction software. As you're conducting the extraction of a cell phone, are you able to see it on a screen or, um, I guess, uh, observe it as it gets downloaded or copied? So as I'm conducting the extraction um, with just 
those programs as extraction tools, I'm able to see that the data is being extracted and how much time it's taken, but I can't see all the, the data that has been extracted until it's done and, and been parsed. Does Gray Key extract the entire contents of the phone? Gray Key will conduct the best extraction that it's able to uh, based on several different factors, such as the make and model of the phone, the software on the phone, the chipset in the phone, and then the same thing for Gray Key as well, the software version on that. Um, so it does a best level extraction, but um, generally it's not able to copy every bit of data off of that device. Does the phone need to be connected to the internet for you to do the extraction? No, it does not. Do you take any steps to ensure that the phone that you are attempting to do an extraction on is not um, manipulated in any way? Yes, so um, the primary initial step is putting the device in airplane mode. Um, it's a term that we call network isolation. It just prevents the network from touching the device, that way it can't be, the data can't be deleted or manipulated. Um, and there are other things like uh, Faraday bags that prevent data transmission. Um, and then once it's paired with gray key, it'll also put it in airplane mode, again, to prevent it from being manipulated. You also use the term parse the data. What does parse mean? Sure, so uh, once the data is extracted, it creates that, that packet I mentioned, so that zip file. And what parsing does is I use another program which is able to look into that, that data packet and it's able to pull the data out of it and organize and categorize it in a manner that we're able to view it as it was intended to be viewed on the device. So an example of that, it would take all the pictures and put them in a pictures category and the locations and put them in a locations category and videos and put them in the videos category. So when we look at the program, the user interface, I'm able to go and see, okay, what were all the pictures on that device or videos or locations? What is the tool you utilize in order to parse the data from the extraction? Uh, generally always physical analyzer, which is a Celebrate program. Is it fair to say that Gray Key assists you with the extraction and Celebrate assists you with the analyzing the data? That depends on the device, but um, in most instances, that is the what I use, yes. As Celebrate analyzes the data, are you able to see it on a screen? Yes. And after it analyzes the data and creates a, a report, is that called a certain thing? Yes, so after the, the data is open, I'll generate two separate reports. One would be a written report, uh, and the other would be a, a digital report that would be turned over to the investigator, and that's called the UFED reader report. A UFED reader report? Yes. The whole process of extracting the data and then utilizing the Cellbrite to analyze it and create the UFED reader, should I get the terms right? Yes. Okay. Um, did that alter the data in any way? No, it does not alter the data that's on the device already. Uh, does it provide a complete copy of the phone? It provides a, a copy of the best copy it's able to. So it doesn't provide a complete copy bit by bit of the device if it's a file system extraction, which is what Gray Key uses, um, but it will copy the entire file system. Does the information that it is able to get from the phone, is that a true copy of the phone, even if it doesn't have all the information at that time? Yes. It's How do you know that? Uh, well, we know it's, it's an accurate copy because it's copying that file system data from that device. So we, we know that, um, that it's pulling accurate data from there. Do you need to have the password to the phone in order to access it using GreatKey? Not necessarily, but it does help. It's, a, it's useful to have. Um, so we try our best to get it when possible. If you were to take a... Um, I guess the original data from a gray key extraction and apply a newer version of a Cellbrite analyst or analytic tool to that original data, would you be able to get more of that data? Um, I don't, I, I can't say we'd necessarily get more data, but at times um, there's data that's not viewable initially um, with certain software versions of, of Cellbrite Physical Analyzer. 
And as uh, the companies learn that there are different items within the phone that they can parse out or, or find, um, newer versions will make things that weren't viewable at a certain time viewable at a later time. Well, let me ask you about that. So you said viewable. So the first um, extraction, the data points come in a certain format and the Celebrite is able to do something to it so that you're able to view it and read it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So as you, as technology changes, if you were able to utilize newer technology, would that then, I guess, make it the data, if there is stuff that wasn't originally able to view, you would then be able to see it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, now, as you're actually doing the extraction and the cell writing, creating a copy of this, Data, are you reaching into the backup, the iClouds, and any of that technology? It, it is possible to do um, generally with gray key, though, no. Okay. How do you, um, well, what's a hash value? So uh, a hash value is something, it, it's a alphanumeric value that's assigned to a particular data set. Um, and it's a unique identifying number similar to a serial number, whereas if that data set doesn't change, that hash value will always be the same. Um, I, use ha I utilize hash values to ensure that from the time I extract the value to the time I uh, open the data set, uh, that it's the same data set. And then I would apply a unique name to that, that data set to ensure that I always have the right one. After you extract the data, parse it with Celebrate and create a UFED, um, what are some of the things that you can see out of a phone? What are some of the contents that you can view? Some of the contents we can view are things like pictures, messages, photos, um, videos, location data. And then there are also things that happen in the background of the device that we have access to um, that we can see, such as if the device was powered on or powered off or plugged or unplugged or turned in a certain orientation or not. So those are some of the things that we look at in the device. You mentioned location data. What does location data look like on a UFED reader? Uh, on a UFED reader, it would be, um, there would be a table on the bottom of it and it would have you know, your date, time, longitude, latitude, uh, the type of, of GPS location data it was. Uh, and then there's also a map that shows up where you can click on a certain data set and it would generate a pin on a map and, and show you where that location was. And by the way, when I say you fed reader, am I talking about the end result of the whole process of downloading and extracting the information from the phone? Either physical analyzer or you fed reader would both do the same thing. Um, does the location data utilize cell towers or GPS? It, it can utilize both. And can you filter the UFED reader to uh, determine if there are location data points without the use of cell towers? Yes, you can, you can filter out cell towers if you wanted to and just have it show specifically GPS or photo data. How does the GPS work on the phone if you take out the cell towers? If you remove, if you filter out the cell towers, it just won't show you uh, where the cell tower was located that the device was utilizing, it'll just show you a GPS fix where the um, the physical handset was located. And is that um, similar to like a Waze or Google Map? It, it could be. When the location data is recorded, does that require a activity or a user interaction with the phone? Not necessarily. No, it, it can happen as a system process. So the, can the phone record a data point for a location if the phone is just in somebody's pocket? Yes. Does it have to be on? Yes. Uh, with respect to communication contained within the phone, are you able to access any kind of data points that are involved with communicating with other people in any way on the cell phone device through the use of Celebrate and the UFED? Yes. Okay, if you could just explain a little bit about what you can get from a phone based on communication. Sure. So um, kind of the two of the big categories we look at are, are phone calls. So if, if someone places or receives a phone call and voicemails um, and then messages as well. So things like um, iMessages, um, short messaging service, SMS messages, uh, Facebook messages. There, there are a lot of messaging apps as well that we look at. 
You mentioned iMessage and SMS messages. What are those? So iMessage um, would be a, a message between two users who have an iPhone and who have sufficient service to, to generate an iMessage. It utilizes uh, Apple servers through data and, and transmit that, transmits that message in that method. Uh, SMS is a short messaging service, um, which is kind of an older technology. And generally, that'll happen between, say, an iPhone and an Android. So anyone who has an iPhone, if you see that green box instead of the blue box, you're sending an SMS or MMS message. Um, and those go through the phone carrier as opposed uh, to through Apple server. Third-party messaging apps, um, are those separate from that iMessage, SMS messages? They, they can be um, categorized under instant messages, but they are different, yes. They, the, it'll show a, a different application handle that as opposed to an iMessage. Would those be things like WhatsApp and Facebook? Yes. Are you, in the course of the extraction, are you able to look at any of those messages that are made through those third-party apps? Yes. Uh, do you need to go directly to the, I guess, the Facebook company or WhatsApp company to get those, or can you just get them directly off the phone? Uh, it depends, but often you can get them directly from the phone. Are you able to determine, based on the extraction, whether or not the phone was, or what times the phone was turned on and turned off? Yes, that is something that, that is recorded on the device. What about the movement of the phone? Yes, there are metrics that also determine that. Mm -hmm. And all that can be viewed throughout the UFED reader? Y yes, as long as it's included in the report. Um, so physical analyzer is, is what we create the report with, and as long as it's included, yes, you'd be able to view that. And I'm going to draw your attention, sir, to May 26, 2019. Were you asked to extract and analyze a phone owned by Fotis Duos? Yes, I was. Who asked you to do that? That was uh, Detective Tom Patton. Were you a certified digital forensic examiner in 2019? Yes, I was. Did you work for a Fairfield Police Department? Yes. Uh, How did you get the call from Tom Patton to do the extraction? I had known Tom um, in our time in the FBI. He was also a task force officer, um, and he also was um, certified through Celebrite. So we had talked about digital forensics. He knew the tools and um, the abilities I had and reached out to me and asked if I could help him with a device. Did Fairfield Police Department have Gray Key in 2019? Yes. And was Gray Key the tool that would allowed uh, you to extract the information from Photos Duelist's phone? Yes, that was what I used. When did you receive that phone? I received that phone uh, on, on May 26, 2019. Where were you? I was in my workstation at the Fairfield Police Department. What type of phone was it? That was an iPhone XS. Was it powered on? It was. It was powered on. Um, it was locked. It had a lock screen, an active lock screen, and it was in airplane mode. Did you get a password? I did. And were you able to open it? Yes, I was able to open it. What acts, if any, did you take on the phone? Um, aside from unlocking it, um, the next thing I did was, was paired it with gray key in order to conduct the extraction of the device. Uh, by the way, did you have authority to conduct this search? Yes, uh, Detective Patton provided me with a signed search warrant, which I did see. So you utilized Gray Key. Did you also then analyze it with Cellbrite? Yes, after the extraction uh, was conducted, um, it was downloaded, and then it was parsed or opened with, with Cellbrite. Did you utilize that hash value process to ensure that the data was the same? Yes. And is that something that you normally do as a digital forensic examiner when you process a phone? Yes. Did you create a UFED reader? I did. Now, did you also utilize Gray Key and Celebrate and extract the data creating a UFED reader on a second phone that was seized from Photos Duos in 2019? Yes. And did you also create an, um, did, and I could be saying this wrong, 
so please correct me if I do. Uh, did you apply Cellbrite or a newer version of technology in 2023 on both the first phone as well as the second phone? Yes, I, I took the most updated version at that time of Cellbrite and reparsed the original extraction on those dates. Okay, you par reparsed the original extraction. Uh, what was the purpose of doing that? To um, attempt to view the original data set with newer technology, again, to be able to see if we were able to view anything newer that wasn't available back then. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions with respect to the first phone that was seized on May 26 and re, uh, is it reparsed or, or reanalyzed in 2023? Both work, yeah. Both work. Okay. Um, did that 2023 report contain anything that was not, a, well, actually withdraw that, that's an awful question. In 2019 report, everything that was involved included in the 2019 report, did that appear in the 2023 report? Yes, it appeared. Okay. And specifically with respect to location data. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. You talked a little bit about some of the location data points you can get from a phone. Were you able to determine any location data points for the phone of Photos Dulos on May 24th, 2019? Yes, I was. Now, I'm going to ask you specifically about the time period between 535 in the morning and 1222 in the afternoon. Uh, did you <coughs> review the Cellbrite UFED report for location data for that time period? Yes, I did. Now, what does that look like when you look at it on a map? Or, um, I'm sorry, not on a map, on a on the UFED reader. So, so it would appear on, on a map on the UFED reader. Um, as I explained, there would be a table below a map. The table would have all of your information as far as the date, time, location data, um, longitude, latitude type of thing. And then there would be a map above it where you could um, then click on a data set and it would put a pin on that map and, and show you where the GPS fix for that device was. On May 24th, 2019, between the time period of 535 and 1222 um, that morning, what was the first time that phone indicated a location time point? Uh, I don't recall that off the top of my head. If I may have a moment with counsel. Your Honor, state's offer is 131. I believe uh, if I can move it all except there are 18 files contained within it, all except a file 18, which when we get to that, uh, I will make an offer at that time. Is there an objection? One moment, Mr. Honor. I'm sorry, may I have a moment? There's no objection to the other ones, Your Honor. Thank you. States 131, except for file 18, admitted as full. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, 
Now, sir, I'm going to draw your attention to the screen behind you. I'm opening file one titled Redacted Device Locations. If you can, sir, um, if you wouldn't mind getting up and going to the screen for a minute. Uh, what's being displayed on the screen, sir? So this is a uh, PDF version of an extraction report for location. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to scroll up. On the top, it, it's a Cellbrite with extraction report. Did you create this? Yes, I did. Okay. And it is 13 pages. I'm going to actually go to the page 13. What is the time that it began? So is the time backwards? Yes, it looks like the uh, the earliest timestamp is at the bottom and the latest timestamp is at the bottom. Now, between 5.35 a.m. and 12.22 a.m., what was the first time that this phone calculated or recorded location data? That would have been uh, this time 6.44 and 42 seconds a.m. Okay, if you can, can you just go through, I know it's hard to see, so if you could please go through and uh, just read the middle box that you imported, it says type, and then visited, precision, horizontal. What does this mean? Uh, are you asking about the horizontal? Yes. So that's the precision accuracy for each GPS fix. Um, it generates a horizontal accuracy in meters, um, and that's basically what that means. Okay, and where is the location data on the screen? The location itself will be the longitude and latitude, which is this box here. Now, you indicated before in your testimony that a individual wouldn't have to actively um, utilize the phone for it to create one of these location data points. Can you tell just by looking at the Cellbrite extraction whether or not the phone was uh, used or interacted with when this data point was created? Um, as far as what created this data set, so what created this um, longitude and latitude marker. There are times where we're able to, but there are also times when, when we're not. So um, I'm not 100% um, on, on what created that data set. What's important to us um, is that it was created and, and is there. Okay. And did you determine the location of this lat longitude? I did. Where is it? That was uh, for Jefferson Crossing in Farmington. Now, between that 5.35 in the morning and 12.20 in the afternoon, um, did that lat longitude, longitude ever change? Yes, it did. Anything significant? Uh, during that period of time, it remained in that area the entire time. And by that area, you mean the area of Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. And I'm going to show you what's been marked in file one, titled Map for Jeff. What does this show, sir? So this would be um, an example of a Celebrite reader report with that table I discussed at the bottom uh, containing all the information related to the location hit. And then uh, once you uh, right click it and go to go to location, it would then give you a pin where that GPS fix occurred. Could you just read the bottom because it's very um, small? Yes. Um, so the bottom, we have our first few uh, boxes, which are, are blank. Um, it starts with the timestamp, which is the, the time that was recorded for the hit itself. Uh, everything is recorded on the device in UTC, uh, which is coordinated universal time. Um, and then it's converted into either Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, so you have the beginning uh, of the hit, which is the original timestamp, and then the, the end of the recorded location, which is the end time, and the position would be the longitude and latitude of the device location. So it looks like it began at 644.42 and ended at 645.05. Is that the same time that was on the uh, written extraction that we just pulled up? Yes, I believe so. Okay, and it says UTC minus four. Does that mean that this is the correct time, the Eastern Daylight Time? That means it, it was converted to, to, yeah, Eastern Daylight Time. Okay, thank you. And all of the data points, which just going back to the 
device location point, it's a 65 uh, location data points, is that correct? Yes. And all of those were in that same location of Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes, they were all in that general area. Uh, between 535 and 1222. Correct. correct. Now, between that same time period of 535, you can have a seat, sir, I'm sorry, uh, 535 and 1222, uh, did you look at the phone and e extract data with respect to instant messages or text messages, I should say? Yes, messages were analyzed within that time frame. Now we talked about SMS, iMessages, and third-party apps. Um, with respect to solely SMS and iMessages, were there IMS or instant messages, text messages, SMS messages um, made during that 535 to 1222 time period? Yes, I observed uh, message data on the phone between that period of time. And now, a couple of questions actually for you before I open the next file, sir. It, is there a way to determine whether or not the SMS and iMessages, not third-party apps, the SMS iMessages were read or opened and viewed? Um, so read, no, I can't tell if somebody actually read it, but I am able to tell if, if um, they, the user clicked on that message and opened it to view it. Does it also give you a time when that person opened it up and viewed it? Depending on the settings on the device and depending on uh, the application, yes, it, it could do that. How are you able to do that or how are you able to see that it was open and viewed? There's a marker uh, in, within Celebrite, so one of the things that it is able to allow us to view is whether or not um, there were red receipts, which is what that's called when, when you click on a message and open it, and um, it will tell us if the red receipts were on that, that device opened that message at that time. Are you able to do that or see that red receipt in the third party messages, WhatsApp and Facebook? Um, again, it depends on the settings um, at times, yes, but it depends on how that user has it set up. Were you able to determine if some text messages and, well, I should, SMS and iMessages were read and viewed uh, during that 535 and 1222 time frame? Uh, it did appear as though the red receipts were turned on. Um, I didn't, I don't believe I saw any uh, red within that time frame though. I'm gonna show you file two marked SMS, Otis messages. <clears throat> So what are we looking at here, if you can? Um, if you can get up, please, and go to the screen again. And if you can, over, it says instant messages, incoming. What does incoming mean? That means it was a message that was sent to this device, so received by the device. And when, what time was the first text message or instant message sent to the device? So the first uh, message within this time frame um, was uh, at 718. And is that reflected on the, on the screen? If you could point to it. Yes, it is. Thank you. And the next category, I believe, says party. What does that mean? The party would be the participants that were, um, that were involved in it. Um, so you can see who the message came from and that um, the participants were the same person. So it shows it as a, um, as a group. And then um, also it'll have the email address for iMessages because um, it, it does utilize the iCloud email address to send an iMessage back and forth, as well as the phone number for the device owner as well. So this uh, instant message at 718 <clears throat> has the phone number and then Rhenia Minutis, is that correct? Yes, it's correct. And it has a from receipt that means it's from that person? Yes. And uh, participants, photos, or fdulos at Yahoo, is that that email address for the iCloud? Yes. Okay. And it also has the uh, number here with Rania Minutis under the participants. Does it include the from and to, sec to individuals under the participants? Yes. And 
does this also give actually the content of the text message? Yes, it does. If you could just read that, please. Sure, it's, it states, uh, call me. My client is ready to meet with you to see plans. I want to take him to the home you redid on Mountain Spring as well. Was that text message read or opened and viewed between 5.35 and 12.22 that morning? Uh, it doesn't appear to, to be that way on here, no. And is that text message, I'm gonna draw your attention actually to the next one. Uh, is it SMS message? Yes. And that is from who? That is from <coughs> At what time? That was on 5-24-2019 at 7.37 a.m. And if you could read that as well? It says, Hutch can come get me. And or can come get it, I apologize. Okay. The line three, please, SMS incoming at what time? That's on 5-24-2019 at 8.36 a.m. And from who? That is from Thor Swanson. And the de description, please. Good morning, Fotis. I hope you guys can make Garth's graduation party Sunday at 5 p.m. Would you mind if I parked our three extra cars in your circle to make room for the pizza truck? Let me know, thanks. Now, line four, I wanna ask you about instant message incoming at what time? That is at 9.02 a.m. on 5-24-2019. And this, Looks like it's from Rainia again with that same message. Call me, my client is ready to meet with you. It looks, is that a duplicate or a second message? That appears to be a second message. So that text message at 718 was reset at 902? It appears that way, yes. Okay. And I'm gonna scroll down to the rest of them. Line five. Instant message at 1012. Yes. Who is that from? That is from Dennis Puebla. And the content? It states, from your end, are you set for this weekend or are you still working things out with Jennifer? And line six, please, SMS. <coughs> A message for, at 1326. What time is that? What time is that? You, what time is that? 13.26, oh, 1.26 uh, p.m. Thank you. And who is that from and what is the content? That is from Hutch Haynes and the content is no phone, text me. And that's from Hutch Haynes to Photos Dulos, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, the last three of these messages, sir, are um, duplicates, are they not? Uh, let's look at seven, which is SMS incoming 13.33 from Hutchings and it says no phone text me. Is oh, that right? It does say that, yes. Um, why is this a duplicate and it has the word red underneath? So it's not necessarily a, a duplicate, it's a, it's a red receipt. Um, so this is indicating um, that this SMS message was uh, clicked on and opened by a, a device user at this specific time at 1333. So that was would be 1.33 in the afternoon? That would be 1.33 p.m. Okay, so that text message was originally sent at 1.26 and it was read at 1.33. Is that how you read that? Uh, it, it was opened at 1.33. Or yes. opened and viewed. Thank you. So going down to line eight, have the text message from Thor Swanson about the graduation party. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, when was that read? Uh, same concept that was open and viewed at 1.34 p.m. When was that text message originally sent, sir? That message was originally sent at 8.36 a.m. And it was open and viewed at what time? At 1.34 p.m. And this last one, Hutch can come get it. When was that originally sent? Again, you're, I'm going to object as asked and answered. We could spend all day going through the ones and having them repeated. I'm just trying to suggest that this is not a good use of uh, court. Time. Well, the court understands the offer to be that there was a gap in time between when a message was sent and when it was. The court does not understand the testimony to be that it was read 
that it was opened. So overruled. So what time was that original message that was sent to the phone? I'm sorry, can you go back to the, uh, I forget which, uh, which message. It would be the Hutch can come get it. I'll draw your attention to line two. Okay, Hutch can come get it was at 7.37 a.m. And at what point was it opened and viewed? 1.35 p.m. Okay, so the text messages or instant messages and SMS <clears throat> messages that were sent uh, according to this between the 718 message and the 1012 message, uh, none of them were open and viewed until uh, the earliest being 133 in the afternoon. Is that correct? Yes. Did you create a um, screenshot or a, a recording to uh, utilizing the Cellbrite program for these messages? Yes, I did. Opening file two and three, label photos messages if you can, sir. Uh, just gonna pause it right there. If you could just explain what this is. Yes, so this is a little bit more of a comprehensive view um, than that PDF is able to give. It obviously has a lot more um, information, uh, particularly up here on the top right. But um, to start on, on the beginning left, um, I just labeled what each arrow stands for. So the timestamp um, of the message of when the message was actually received, which is right here where it says timestamp, and um, the application is showing you that this was an iMessage. Um, then in red would be the red arrow indicating when that, that red receipt was generated, so when that message um, was opened. So for this particular iMessage, I know it wasn't available to be viewed on that last PDF, but it is on this. Um, it shows that at 13.33, so at 1.33 p.m., uh, that message was was opened and viewed. That is the call me. My client is ready to meet with you to see plans. I want to take him to the home you redid on Mountain Spring Road. Is that the seven o'clock one or the nine o'clock one? That one is the one at seven eighteen a.m. And on the PDF version, you couldn't tell that that had been opened and viewed, but you can on on the Cellbrite extraction. Yes, it didn't have a category for that on the, on the PDF. Okay. And at what time was that opened and viewed? at 1.33 p.m. Well, counsel, the court wants to make sure it understands the counsel's question. The PDF states that read means device time message was opened, but counsel keeps saying viewed. I apologize, Your Honor, I was using the witness's words, which is opened and viewed as opposed to read. If I may just inquire and clarify with him. Yes. Uh, so it does say on the actual Cellbrite report we're looking at here, uh, the word red. Do you see the arrow? Yes. Well, I'm going to object to the, this is not the actual Cellbrite report. This is some kind of, uh, which I'm not objecting to, a summary chart, I think, that was created for the purposes of this trial. So I just would. That's well, correct. I, I believe he created this, correct? Correct. To uh, clarify, Your Honor, I, I will change my, the way I phrase it. Um, right. Well, right now is the time to take a break. Yes, Your Honor. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will resume. Let's set it uh, at 2.05, ladies and gentlemen. Please do not discuss the case.